The first day in the land of apples was a bitter cold, for the snow still covered the ground and the trees were bare. A large bell rang for breakfast, its large metallic voice crashing through the belfry and into our ears. The annoying clatter of shoes on floors gave us no peace. The constant clash of noises, with a flow of voices murmuring in a known tongue, made a bedlam within which I was safely tied. And though my spirit broke itself in struggling for its lost freedom, all was useless. A pale-faced woman, with white hair, came up after us. We were placed in a line of girls, who were marching into the dining room. These were Indian girls, in stiff shoes, and closely clinging dresses. The small girls wore sleeved aprons and shingled hair. Apron, overcoat, shingled hair, hair cut from the back. As I walked noiselessly in my soft moccasins. Moccasins, shoes. I felt like sinking to the floor as my blanket had been took off from my shoulders. I looked hard at the Indian girls, who seemed not to care that they were even more immodestly dressed than me in their tightly fitting clothes. Immodestly, shamelessly. While we marched in, the boys entered at an opposite door. I watched three of them. They looked as uncomfortable as I felt. A small bell was tapped and everyone drew a chair from under the table. Supposing this meant they were to be seated, I pulled out my chair and sat on it. When I turned my head, I saw that I was the only one seated, all the rest remained standing. Just as I began to get up, looking shyly around to see how chairs were to be used, a second bell was sounded. All were seated, and I had to crawl back into my chair again. I heard a man's voice, and I looked around to see him. But all the others hung their heads, over their plates. As I glanced at the tables, I caught the eyes of a pale-faced woman upon me. Immediately I dropped my eyes, thinking why I was so keenly watched by the strange woman. Then, a third bell was tapped. Everyone picked up his knife and fork, and began eating. I began crying instead, for I was afraid to risk anything more. But this eating by formula was not the hardest trial in that first day of my school. Later in the morning, my friend, Jordwin, gave me a terrible warning. I know a few words of English. I have heard the pale-faced woman talk about cutting our long, heavy hair. What? Our mothers have taught us that only unskilled warriors, who were captured, had their hair shingled by the enemy. <coughs> Among our people, short hair was worn by mourners and shingled hair by cowards. Mourners, sorrowful people. We have to submit, because they are strong. No, I will not submit. I will struggle first. I watched my chance, and when no one noticed, I disappeared. I crept up the stairs as quietly as I could, in my squeaking shoes. I passed along the hall, without knowing where I was going. I found a room with three white beds. The windows were covered with green curtains, which made the room very dim. Thankful that no one was there, I directed my steps towards the farthest corner from the door. I crawled under the bed. From my hiding place, I peeped out, trembling with fear, whenever I heard footsteps nearby. Though, in the hall, loud voices were calling my name, and I knew that even Jude Wynn was searching for me. I did not answer. Then the steps became quicker and the voice became louder. The sounds came nearer and nearer. I watched them open closet doors and peek behind large trunks. Someone threw up the curtains, and the room was filled with sudden light. What caused them to bend and look under the bed, I do not know. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching. I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and had them cut off one of my thick braids. Braids, woven strands of hair. Then I lost my spirit. Since the day I was taken away from my mother, I had suffered extreme indignities. Indignities, humiliations. People had stared at me. I had been tossed about in the air like a wooden puppet. And now my long hair was shingled like a coward's. 
In my pain, I cried for my mother, but no one came to comfort me. Not the soul reason quietly with me, as my mother used to do. For now, I was only one of many little animals, driven by a herder. When I was studying in the third class, I hadn't heard people speak openly of untouchability. But I had already seen, felt, experienced, and been humiliated by what it is. I was walking from school to home one day, an old bag hanging from my shoulder. Actually, it was possible to walk the distance in 10 minutes. But usually, it would take me at least 30 minutes to reach home. Because, I would wander along, watching all the fun and games that were going on, all the entertainment novelties and oddities, in the streets, the shops, and the bazaar. Novelties and oddities, new and strange things. The performing monkey, the snake which the snake charmer kept in its box, and displayed from time to time, the cyclist who hadn't got off his bike for three days, and who kept pedaling as hard as he could, from the starting of the day, the rupee notes that were pinned on his shirt to encourage him. The spinning wheels, the Maurya temple and the bell hanging there, the pongal offerings being cooked in front of the temple, the dried fish stall by the statue of Gandhi, the sweet stall, the stall selling snacks, and all the other shops, the street light always demonstrating how it could change from blue to violet, the Narai Kuravyan hunter Jim C with his lima in cages, selling needles, clay beads and instruments, for cleaning out the ears. Oh, I could go on and on. Each thing would pull me to a standstill, and not allow me to go any further. At times, people from various political parties would arrive, set up a stage, and harangue us through their mics. Harangue, make a loud speech. Then, there might be a street play, or a puppet show, or a no magic, no miracle stunt performance. All these would happen from time to time. But, almost certainly, there would be some entertainment or other going on. Otherwise, there were coffee clubs in the bazaar, the way each waiter cooled the coffee, lifting a glass high up, and pouring its contents into another tumbler, held in his other hand. Or the way some people sat in front of the shops, chopping up onion, their eyes turned elsewhere, so that they would not hurt. Or the almond tree growing there, and its fruit, which was occasionally blown down by the wind. All these sights taken together, would fix my legs, and stop me from going home. And then, according to the season, there would be mango, cucumber, sugar cane, sweet potato, palm shoots, gram, palm syrup and palm fruit, guavas, and jackfruit. Every day, I would see people selling sweet and tasty fried snacks, pear some, pava, boiled tamarind seeds, and iced lollies. Gazing at all this, one day, I came to my street, my bag slung over my shoulder. At the opposite corner, a threshing floor had been set up, and the landlord watched the proceedings, seated on a piece of sack, spread over a stone ledge. Our people were hard at work, driving cattle in pairs, round and round, to tread out the grain from the straw. The animals' mouths were closed, so that they wouldn't eat the straw. I stood for a while there, watching the fun. Just then, an elder came along from the direction of the bazaar. The manner in which he was walking along, made me want to giggle. I wanted to scream with laughter, at the sight of such a big man, carrying a small packet in that fashion. I guessed, there was something like vadai, or green banana bhaji in the packet. Because the wrapping paper was stained with oil. He held the packet by its string, without touching it. I stood thinking to myself. If he holds it like that, won't the package fall, and the vadais fall out? The elder went straight up to the landlord, bowed low, and extended the packet towards him. The landlord opened the parcel, and began to eat the vadais. After I had watched all this, at last I went home. My elder brother, Anan, was there. I told him the story in all its comic detail. I fell about with laughter at the memory of such a big man, making such a game out of carrying parcel. But Anon was not amused. This wasn't being funny, when he carried the package like that. Everybody believed that they were upper caste, and therefore, must not touch us. If they did, they would be polluted. That's why he had to carry the package by its string. 
When I heard this, I didn't want to laugh anymore and I felt terribly sad. How could they believe that it was disgusting if one of us held that package in his hands, even though the vadai had been wrapped first in a banana leaf and then parceled in paper? I felt so provoked and angry that I wanted to touch those unlucky vadais myself straight away. Why would we have to bring and carry for these people? Such an important elder of ours goes calmly to the shops to fetch snacks and hands them over respectfully, bowing and shrinking to this fellow who just sits there and stuffs the snacks into his mouth. How was it that these fellows thought so much of themselves? Because they had collected four coins together, does that mean they must lose all human feelings? But we too are human beings. Our people should never run these small errands for these fellows. We should work in their fields, take home our wages, and leave it at that. Anon was studying at a university. He had come home for the holidays. He would often go to the library in our neighboring village, in order to borrow books. He was on his way home one day, walking along the banks of the irrigation tank. One of the landlord's men came up behind him, and thinking Anon unfamiliar, asked him. Who are you, Appa? What's your name? Anon. Fabi, on which street do you live? The point of this asking was that, if he knew on which street we lived, he would know our caste too. Because we are born into this community, we are never given any honor or dignity or respect. We are deprived of all that. But if we study and make progress, we can throw away these indignities. So, study with care, learn all you can. If you are always ahead in your lessons, people will come to you of their own accord, and attach themselves to you. Work hard, and learn. The words that Alan spoke to me that day, made a very deep impression on me. And I studied hard, with all my breath, and being, in a madness almost. As I had urged, I stood first in my class. And because of that, Many people became my friends.